Okay. Then I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Well, first of all, let's check. You guys can hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's see here. Okay, we started talking about composites, chapter six, and we're continuing that today. We have a few other things that are left to talk about. Do, do, do. Okay. Let's see what we have here. We know that composite is uh, technically a matrix, right? We have fillers and we have a matrix and coupling agent. And these are the main things that it has. Uh, we know that the more fillers that we have, the stiffer the uh, composite will be. Uh, the more resin, the less stiff it will be. And we know that we have different types of composite based on the filler, microfill, or macro, micro, hybrid, and nano afterwards. Uh, we know one of the main problems of the composite is the polymerization shrinkage. Uh, and that means when we cure composite, well, that's the here. When we cure composite, it will uh, shrink. And that's why we want to make it in layers. Uh, and that's the technique that is used. Usually, we have regular cure and chemical cure. And we know that we have photo initiators like uh, camphoroquinone. And we know some of the uh, physical properties of composite. We know we have different delivery systems, syringe, a sonic fill, a compule. And I think we got to that point almost. So let's start here again, just to fill this last slide up. Uh, we know that we have different types of composite, I uh, guess technically based on use in a way or their viscosity. So we have Pitts and Fisher sealants. Uh, we have flowable composite. And we know for these, the low viscosity that means High resin, right? And low filler, right? Same thing here for the flowable. Uh, packable is the other way. We have low resin and higher filler. And the bulk uh, fill and the core buildup, you have more, usually more filler inside of these, especially for the core buildup because uh, you want a lot of strength. And I think we got to this point. So um, depending on where, wherever we're going to use it, uh, is it on an interior part of the mouth or is it on the posterior or stress bearing areas? That's when we have to kind of choose, uh, well, the dentist will be choosing what type of composite uh, is better for that uh, area, to treat that area. So for example, here you can see in the interior portions of the mouth, because we don't have a lot of stress bearing area. So uh, what we will be focusing more on is to match the color, the shade of the patient teeth, right? And we want a high polish. So most probably this, the uh, composite that we're going to pick would be uh, maybe flowable or a little bit less filled, more resin, right? Because again, it does not get exposed much to a lot of occlusal loads. Not like with the stress bearing areas like the posterior teeth where you need strength, uh, strength and wear resistance. Uh, and that's, again, you'll use maybe a high filled composite or bulk fill composite. So depending on where you're using it, uh, and that's how we're going to choose the better uh, selection. Flowable in general should not be used in areas would have a lot of stress or abrasion because we know flowable have what less uh, filler and more resin. And we know that the more the resin that you have, the less the stiff the composite will be. And that's why we don't use it in these areas. And again, it's all based at the end of the day at the dentist's uh, choice and uh, 
how they would prefer to practice and what materials they're using from what company. So it depends on their system that they're using. Shade guide. So uh, we started practicing composite again. Um, we practice with both uh, labs. Uh, Friday lab will still need to practice, uh, but we've already done that as well one time at least. Uh, this is uh, an important step in the composite uh, work because we need to match that with one of the main benefits of composite. It's a tooth colored material, correct? And we want to get the patient um, to have almost natural looking teeth without the filling showing up. So that's why we start using these shade guides and they run uh, with a lot of different shades. And again, there are different systems for these. One of the most uh, used ones is the Vita shade guide, which you see here and we have in the lab. And technically, uh, manufacturers will try to match the Vita shade guide. And if you saw that the patient teeth is C1 or C2, you can just get a composite that is C1 or C2 and match it to the tooth. When we are trying to match, because this sometimes, well, a lot of times it's uh, us with the dentist or sometimes the dentist might, uh, you know, let us just choose the shade guide with the patient. Uh, but again, a lot of times it's multiple people. So we will be there. The dentist will be there. And the patient also would help us with the choosing on, of the shade guide. When we are doing the shade guide, we have to use natural light source, right? Because if you put the patient under that yellow or bright white um, light of the operatory, it will look different. That's not how we look at each other, right? We don't look at each other with a bright light um, focused on our teeth. So usually we look at, at each other with normal natural lighting. So when we're choosing the shade guide, we have to use that and turn off the regular light from the uh, from the operatory. Uh, when we are trying to select the teeth, the teeth should be wet a little bit more because again, that's how uh, the more the, the natural, the color, that's how we usually have our teeth usually are wet because of the saliva because also drier teeth would appear, huh? Right, lighter in color. When you dry the teeth, they would appear a little bit lighter in color. And then again, we might mismatch uh, the patient's teeth. A good practice that the dentist would do also to cure a small quantity of the composite on the tooth, just to check. So if you look at this picture here, what we did, uh, for example, we tried to match the shade guide. And then let's say we decided on one of them. So what the dentist might do, just put uh, you know some of that composite on the tooth surface, on the outer tooth surface, and they cure it. And then they see how the tooth color would match, uh, how the composite will match the tooth color. So uh, again, because once you cure it, it will kind of show you the better reflection of the light uh, and the better reflection of the color or the shade. Uh, and then these can be removed easily right away. Anyway, these are. Most of it is will be interior because posterior teeth is hard really to see. But I mean, still depends really on the dentist, you know, and how much they want to spend time and effort. And if they have a system in place, I mean, why not? You have your composites and you try to match it as much as possible. Like we saw, they even put these stains on the posterior teeth to look more natural. So, yeah. There is a composite. I should have added it here. There's a new composite that is, I think they call it monochromatic or something like that, where it doesn't have any shades. They made it in a way, I'll try to look it up. They made it in a way where you put it in and it will match the tooth color magically. Like it has some reflective uh, characteristics in it that will actually reflect the norm, the, the color of the tooth without having to match different shades. It just comes in one shade. You put it on the tooth, you cure it. Uh, and with time and technically even after you cure it right away, uh, you'll have almost same color as the tooth. I'll look it up. Uh, it was interesting. Um, it's just a new, it, it's really new thing that is coming on um, that you don't have to really match any shade and it, it just matches most of the 
shades of the teeth by itself by reflecting the color somehow. Okay. Uh, a lot of dentists definitely mix multiple uh, shades to get the correct shade. So sometimes um, there we have even dentin shades and we have enamel shades. So some dentists will go further into that. So they will choose some uh, colors for the dentin. And then for the enamel, there will be more like translucent colors that they can just see uh, through. And then we can get to see the actual color of the tooth. Again, it just depends on how much the dentist wants to invest time and effort in treating the tooth and reshaping it. And definitely anterior teeth are more important than posterior. Okay, so now let's get more in depth into the process of actually bonding the uh, bonding composite to the tooth. So how does that actually happen? We know that there are three main steps for composite, right? We have the A, B, C. So A, we etch, right? Acid etch. And then B, we bond. And then we do the composite. So the steps that we're going to talk about, which how the resin would actually bond, and we call a resin to resin bonding, uh, how it bonds to the tooth and then how it's bonded to itself. So this comes after we etch the tooth, right? This These steps that we're going to talk about, this is after we etch the tooth. So we know acid etch, we already etched the tooth. Uh, we etched it for 20 to 30 seconds, right? We wash it real well, we do our isolation, and then we start with the bond. So when we add the bond to the, to the tooth, and again, we know the main reason of bond is to hold the composite to the tooth, right? The bond will go into where the dentinal tubules, correct, or the enamel rods, and it'll create these tags inside of them. And they will make a layer for us, the bond will make a layer for us that will actually be helped to uh, connect the composite to it. If we look at this picture here, so this is like under the microscope, and you can see these number T here as the, uh, the resin tags, and this is inside of the dentinal tubules, for example. They go in and they hold themselves really well into the dentinal tubules. The H is the hybrid layer, and that's what we're talking about there in the top, at the top here. And that is technically the layer that would help the composite to attach to the bond. We have an adhesive layer as well, and then we have composite. And that is technically a resin to resin uh bond you have the bonding part that is hold to the tooth and then the composite that will hold to the uh, hybrid layer of the comp of the bond so if we fill these things out here the uh, resin infiltrated dentin is called a hybrid zone or a hybrid layer like we saw there so that is the layer where the composite adhere to technically so after we do the bonding and again we have the hybrid layer the first layer of the composite the initial increment of composite will chemically bond to the the resin right that resin layer that we put in there technically to the bond and then as we add more and more increments of composite right the additional increment will bond to the previously placed composite right so the first increment will will bond to the resin and then all of the rest of them will keep bonding to that uh outer layer of what we placed okay all good yes we have something called air inhibition layer so this is a layer i did talk about that a little bit before but this is a thin layer of unpolymerized resin 
that is on the surface of the composite. So after we place a layer of composite and when we cure it, most of it will cure, but we have a thin layer at the end of it that will not cure completely. And that is the air inhibition layer or inhibited layer because they are, it is exposed to air, so it does not polymerize completely. This is a good thing because then we can add another layer of composite to it and that, and that other layer to the composite will bond to the previous layer and, that's, and so on and so forth. We keep adding and adding and that's how we can keep the composite sticking to itself. So at the end, as you can see, facilitate the, the chemical bond with the next layer. At the end, the final air inhibited layer will be removed by what? Like after we finish the tooth, right? We fill out the complete tooth. We, la we got to the last layer uh, of composite. We will remove that air inhibition layer by polishing, right? Exactly. And or finishing, right? So after we are done with our composite, we still have one layer. And that's why if you, uh, if you had composite done, you might smell something at the end. You smell, you have a smell of a little bit like a resin. Uh, that is usually that unpolymerized last layer. If they didn't polish your tooth, you might smell it a little bit. You feel there is a, a smell of something different in your mouth. But anyway, usually we polish a uh, um, composite and remove it. If we do not polish it, there's another technique where they put glycerin on top of it with just some kind of gel and they cure it through the glycerin. And by doing that, uh, they will eliminate the air inhibition layer um, and we don't have to do the polishing and finishing to remove it. So some dentists would do that. We did see a video and I think I told you at the time, they put that jelly thing on the tooth uh, on the composite and they cure it again just for the air inhibition layer. Any questions about that? Easy, right? So we have the tags, the, the hybrid layer, and then the composite there that will stick to itself. Contaminants, definitely any contaminants that, you know, happen on the tooth while we're working, they're not good. And that's why, you know, we want to keep a good uh, isolation. Um, and that's why, again, when we're doing sealants or composite, uh, a dry field is very, very important. Dry and clean field is very important for our work because if any saliva got into the tooth, uh, if blood got into the tooth, then our work will be compromised. So if we have uh, any contamination, we have to re Etch, re-etch, exactly. So if you etch your tooth and you clean it up and then the patient touched it with their tongue, maybe, wash it, re-etch it again, and do the work. Again, that's why really it's really important to have uh, a dry field as much as possible using um, rubber dam or any other method that we can use to make sure that no contaminants, no saliva, no blood would remain on the tooth. Okay, so one of the things that we use definitely to place composite is the composite instrument, and it's made with coating of non-stick material. Uh, as we have seen in the lab, usually it kind of gold-plated, sometimes black, and it comes in different shapes and types. Uh, and you can see this have almost everything, an acorn, uh, a kind of a ball burnisher at the end, and different ends here. It just depends on the dentist and what they prefer. Um, a lot of times, we, uh, when we are working, you'll see the dentist might ask you or might dip their instrument in the bond, in the mixing well, the small mixing well that you hold you know, for the bonding. Uh, it is not recommended because this can interfere with the, the quality of the composite. So for example, they would dip it in bond or alcohol and they, they will use it to, to play with the, with the composite, to manipulate composite and shape it. And this will make the composite a little bit diluted and it will interfere with the, with the polymerization process of it. Again, this is kind of a dentist thing. There's even special uh, cleaning 
uh, sponges that are for the composite instruments that you can buy. But anyway, uh, and I've read before, and I think I told you that some composite instruments will be, uh, they would ask you in the instructions not to place it in the ultrasonic cleaner because it can, again, interfere with that coating that it has uh, on top of it. So, and the eugenol materials should not be placed under composite, and we already know that. We talked about that before because, again, it inter interferes with the bonding process of the composite. All good? Huh? Yes? Yes. Okay. So composite cross-contamination and handling, that's a, an important issue because, you know, we use some of these uh, syringes, whether with composite or sealant, um, and we reuse them every time. So we hold them with our gloves that are dirty, that was in the patient mouth. Uh, so as you can see, there are some plastic covers for them that we can technically put on, but I don't think a lot of people do that. Uh, most of the time, we just spray it and clean it up, and that's how we disinfect it. Spray it really well, wipe it off, and then reuse it. We cannot sterilize these because, again, it will interfere with everything. It must probably set automatically by the heat. Uh, the only thing that technically we can replace, as you know, is the tip. Uh, that we can replace. But again, um, it, you know, we try our best to get these uh, clean and that's why these compules or the composite capsules are more uh, favorite because they are single use. You know, you use it, you dispose of it, you don't use it for another patient, even if you still have some parts in it. And I can tell you, you'll see some offices will reuse it again. Like if they use half of that compule, they will just spray it and reuse it again, you know, just like we do with these, but technically they're not intended for that uh, purpose. So compules are disposable. We should not reuse them. And again, compules are these uh, small uh, composite capsules. Sometimes they call them that we use with the composite guns uh, to place composite. They can be flowable or packable. And we know that these reusable syringes, as I said, uh, you have to be careful with handling them. These delivery tips are disposable. You want to recap, spray, and wipe after each use. Uh, so make sure that you disinfect them. So just notice that we have to always recap it. So after we remove the tip, uh, we have to recap it with the cap that it comes with. But I think almost all of the ones that we have in the in the lab for, for example, for sealants, the cap was thrown away or something like that, which it should not. But it has a small cap that you have to recap it with. Anyway, uh, if we're using composite and we place it in the refrigerator, it's better to remove it before so that uh, you use it for about an hour. And sometimes some dentists will prefer to warm composite. So uh, this is a composite warmer. It's a small, uh, you know, desktop warmer that we place, like we put on the, I think it's a USB or something. But anyway, it will warm up the composites and it will make it flow better. Uh, if you've noticed when you're working with me, it's really hard to really take these composite out with the composite gun because they're a little bit set uh, or they're a little bit cold. Uh, then when we warm them, it will be much easier, much better, the flow. So like the dentist I was I used to work with, uh, he asks sometimes, especially in colder days, he asks for warm water. Get him warm water. He put one of these compules or two of them in the warm water before he start working with them. Again, just to heat it up a little bit because it will allow a better flow of the composite and better uh, working with it. And again, there are these uh, composite warmers that are out there some dentists might use. All good? All good. Light curing. So curing lights uh, are very important part of our composite work. As I mentioned before, um, 
because again if you do everything correctly like you drill out the cavity well you prepare it correctly you choose the great composite material you do your bonding correct and everything and you do your composite well if you do not cure that composite the right amount or the in the right way then all of that work is gone right and that's why i always tell you if you're not sure that you cured the composite always let the dentist know because they would depend on us to make sure that we cure the composite correctly because they're not going to be looking at the, the curing light while you're doing that right you'll be the person that is looking at the curing light so always make sure that you're placing the curing light correctly on top of the tooth you're curing it the right amount so you know for composite we know we have to cure it for 40 seconds and there's nothing as uh over curing there's always just under curing problems there's no over curing problems so again if you're in doubt of curing your composite always let your dentist know let me cure it again i think i didn't cure it well or just let me cure it again and you know again the, it's, it's a good thing to make sure that you cure it well but not just the placement of it uh, the curing light itself, we have different types of curing lights and we have different intensities. And if you remember, we did talk about the, uh, the, the photo initiators that we have. So our curing light must match the photo initiators that are in our composite uh, material. And again, this is something that they talk a lot about in these lectures, you know, in the dental meetings. A lot of times there's a note about do you know your curing light or not? Do you know what type of photo and shaders your curing light actually cures? Does it match the composite that you're using? It is definitely the responsible of the dentist, but again, it's very important for us to know that. Uh, again, because they're all kind of different. And then the other problem with the curing light, because these curing lights nowadays, most of them are uh, battery powered, right? And they're LED. So how do we know that that battery is giving all of its energy, right? Anything that is battery um, powered, you know, the battery can deteriorate a little bit. And then the energy that comes out of the curing light might not be the same energy when we bought it in the first place. So we need to test our curing lights uh, periodically. Technically, I think every week or two weeks, uh, we have to check the curing light capacity with the with the device that you see here they call a radio meter uh, radio meter that is technically will measure the light intensity and will tell you exactly if your curing light is uh curing correctly so again it's very important the composite did not receive if the composite did not receive the correct amount of cure they would not polymerize correctly <laughs> right <laughs> they would have shorter life they might fracture they might discolor uh they might have excessive wear uh they would have recurrent caries they would have lack of retention so all of these big problems just because we did not cure the composite well so again as i said it's i mean almost every lay every step technically in our process when we're doing composite filling uh, is important. You know, if you did not etch well, if you did not bond well, if you did not use the correct composite, and then at the end, if you did not cure it well. So each step is really important, although there might feel, you know, just small steps, uh, but they're very important to make sure. And then again, the techniques that the dentists use is very important to make sure that you get a great filling. Factors that will affect the cure. So uh, shorter curing time, if you cure it short, you know, less amount, inadequate light output. So we have to use the geometer to measure the light intensity again. And now you'll ask, you know, <laughs> you go to offices and you'll see. And if you find an office that uses a radiometer, tell me. <laughs> it, it, I don't think, you know, a lot of offices use that, but Almost every time I go to a session, you know, a continuous education session that they talk about composite and something about they will mention that, you know, you have to make sure you're using something to measure the, your light intensity. Uh, and then again, um, even something like, I think I didn't mention that here maybe, but like the tip of the, of the curing light, 
Uh, a lot of people would not use a protective covering for it. They might just disinfect it or sterilize it. But if you touch the composite while you're working with it, it will be contaminated and the light will not go through it correctly. So it can be, you know, contaminated with some particles of composite. So again, a lot of different things with the curing light that are very important for our work. So you use the wrong wavelength of the light, you, correct, you incorrectly position it. All of these factors can affect the curing of our composite. So how do we position it? We try at the beginning to be about one millimeters away at the beginning, just you know, to start with, and then you get really close to the composite almost touching it we definitely do not want to touch the composite our curing tip should be positioned at multiplied by two 90, 90 degrees right <laughs> so 90 degrees to the composite to make sure that you're giving your composite a correct, a complete cure. And then for class two and class three, we can cure it also from what sides? Huh? Buckle and distal, because that's, that's these are the areas that we can access. You know, if we can access mesially, why not? But usually mesially, uh, that's when we do the 90 degree, like we from the occlusal side, we cure it more than anything else. But again, if we uh, are class two or class three, we can do it a buckle and lingual cure at the end as well. I think we did see that here. You know, when we have uh, a composite, we cure it from the occlusal side and then we cure it buccally and lingually to make sure that we're curing everything. Um, completely and again usually you remove the uh the the matrix band and then we do the curing just to make sure that we did it right most probably once you remove it you can cure the buckley and lingual okay. yeah because it, yeah and again there's no under curing there's always over i mean there's no over curing there's under so you might cure it multiple times just to make sure you got the correct uh so when will you need more longer curing times if the angulation is compromised so you could not reach well to the to the tooth right you, you don't have enough access to cure it at the beginning with all of the things that are around you you cure it but not at a 90 degree angle so you need to cure it again right longer curing time when there is thicker uh increments like bulk fill composites right because we know that the usual increment is two millimeters and that's, again, that is to allow us to compensate for the uh, polymerization shrinkage and to uh, allow us to give, to get the curing light to go through all of the layers of a composite. So if we have a thicker increment, like the bulk fill, when we do four millimeters of composite, then we have to uh, do better. So what do you think? Lighter or darker composites will require more curing time? Huh? <laughs> Darker. Darker composites, because again, the light doesn't flow through them as well. So, you know, the darker the shades of the teeth, the darker the composite that we choose, and then we might need a little bit more curing time. If the composites are located away. away. <laughs> farther <laughs> from the light probe, right? So again, like a class two, and you're curing it from the occlusal side, and you cannot really reach to the base of the 
of the class two. So you might need to cure it again multiple times to make sure that you get that. And then if we have wider light tips, so some curing lights come with uh, a curing tip, you know, the tip of the curing light that is a little bit more wider um, to, you know, they technically provided so you can cure larger areas, but you might need more curing time to cure. Okay. <clears throat> so we have different types of curing lights. And as I mentioned, the curing light must match the composites, composites, photo and shaders, right? And that's one of the main photo and shaders that we have come from Queen on. <laughs> Camphoroquinone. Camphoroquinone. Yeah. As far as I know. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, I'll make you have to pronounce it by sound. <laughs> Click the button here and pronounce it. <laughs> okay. Light emitting diode is one. So, these are the types of the curing lights that we have in the market. The older one actually is the halogen one that you don't see much anymore. It's just uh, like a halogen light bulb, you know, the regular light bulbs, the yellow ones that we have. Um, it is the conventional again. It there is a there are problems with it. It's a little bit bigger, uh, and it also generates heat, right? So that is a problem with that, and it's next to the lowest in the intensity. That is not used much anymore or, you know, is much less used uh, nowadays. And then we have the light emitting diode, which is LED, which would we have in the lab technically. So it has a lowest intensity, but no heat. So it's not as intense, but again, because there's no heat. Uh, because it's uh, it's small, you can carry it. You know, you don't have to have it wired. It's all um, battery powered. That's why uh, it's more preferred. Uh, so, and that's the regular curing light for. I mean, this is the regular curing time, the conventional curing, which is twenty to forty seconds. That's that's the regular curing time uh, when we cure with LED or just even the conventional uh, curing light. So most popular newer versions can be more intense, definitely. It's just getting better and better. There are all kinds of different types of, of curing light. We have plasma arc uh, curing and we have argon laser. So this is considered as rapid curing. It is fast and intense and it will generate heat. And the argon one, it is the fastest and the most intense. It's about even less sometimes, like a two second, you just click, click, and that's it. It cures the composite. So like, instead of waiting, you know, that 20 seconds, we click and keep waiting until it cures. You do this, and like within two seconds, it might cure it. But again, these are also depending on, are you using the composite that can be cured uh, and initiated by an argon laser curing light? Uh, and how much the thickness of the composite that you have. So there are other things that you have to think about. Again, this is all based on the dentist choice and preference, uh, but this will provide much faster curing. You don't have to wait for these 20 or 40 seconds to do the curing. So uh, it's just, uh, it's great. And it's just, again, there, there's a lot of uh, new curing lights that are coming in the market that have, again, Shorter curing lights, better intensity, uh, covering all type of photo initiators that are out there. They just get better and better. But most of the offices would use the regular LED curing light. All good? Okay. So we have different methods when we are curing the composite. We have the ramped, we have the stepped, and we have the pulse delay. So 
these are just the definitions for these RAM. So you start low and gradually to high within 10 seconds. Low intensity for 10 for the step, low intensity for 10 and then immediately to maximum. And the pulse delay, you might cure just really quick and then you start shaping the composite and then you cure it completely at the end. So it just depends again on what the manufacturer would prefer you to cure the composite with. Um, and again, the light and the matching of light and composite. So it depends again and depends on the dentist's choice of these curing lights. And some curing lights, again, it has that option in them. You can change the way that they operate instead of just curing completely. Uh, one time they can do like an on and off and on and off way of curing or it can be just gradual increase. So there are different uh, options with that. Any questions so far? No, all good. Okay, we're almost there, I think. So for eye protection, definitely the blue light can damage the retina, yes. Um, <laughs> the goggles that we have, you know, the red ones, or kind of orangey ones. Uh, these would filter the blue lights, so it will protect our eyes. Uh, a filter shield can we also use, so we can use this that is on the hearing light, and also there are like a, a big shield that we can hold with our hand. It has like a handle, and then we can hold it while we're curing. And again, as I told you also, there are some lights that have that on them directly so we can see and that is for us and for the patient yes so we give our patients also these um, goggles to protect them from the curing light that we apply and if you guys have had this given to them while they're doing a work yeah no yeah sometimes yeah yeah, see, not a lot of people, yeah, not, well, it's not, uh, it is, it, it should be done, but again, not a lot of offices might do that. Exactly, right? That's an easier way. <laughs> but again, it's important to protect our patients. So yeah, close your eyes or just making sure that you're, you know, covering the curing light and holding it stable, all these things. Infection control, as you know, we can cover them the whole curing light and also the tips can be autoclaved yes these small tips here on the top of the curing light can be sterilized do 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 Okay, composite repair and finishing. So small fact fractures might be repaired and redone, right? Or replaced. The finishing and the polishing of the composite is important. So it corrects any irregularities, remove excess material, make it smooth. Sometimes we use sealers on top of the composite surface after we finish it and polish it just like a sealant that we place on the teeth um, and this would help with by resealing all the margins that we open by the polymerization so to compensate for that shrinkage we might add some uh, sealers again for the composite so to reduce any micro leakage that can happen do 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 indirect placement so I think at the beginning when we were talking, we said this is all direct, uh, direct placement, which means, you know, chair side, we drill the patient tooth, we directly etch it and bond it and put the composite inside of it. And that is a directly placed um, restoration. We can do an indirect work. So we can do it by fabricating 
the composites outside of the patient mouth. And this will give us a good thing because this would have the polymerization shrinkage happening outside of the patient mouth, right? Uh, and we can compensate for that by fixing the composite to the tooth by a cement more than like a composite. So like we cure the composite outside the patient mouth, we do it, I'll show you a video about that. And then we can do a cement and we cement it to the patient. This can reduce the micro leakage. And again, sometimes in areas where we have, uh, where we need a lot of more strength of the composite, we can actually send it to the lab. The lab would fabricate a higher strength material, like a crown material, but in a shape of an inlay, technically this is an inlay, and then we can put it in the mouth. So you can see like, this is just a simple example. Uh, we have a filling here that we want to replace, right? So we drill it out and we take uh, an impression of the, the cavity preparation and we make it as a cast. And then we use this cast to fill up the patient tooth outside of the patient mouth, as you can see here. And we remove it then and we place it inside of the patient mouth. And then we glue it with, with uh, cement. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. It can be just removed. And then do you have to like do any kind of I'm just curious where you would do any type of what I'm sorry, you say? Like cleaning or Yeah, yeah, definitely. You would polish it, make sure that it's nice, the margins are good, the contours are right, as much as you can because now you can work with it with your hand. Okay. And then Definitely, you can cure it in all directions, right? So you're not missing any area. You cure it from mesial, you cure it distally. Even you cure it from the inside of the tooth, right? Like Because we're going to hold it out. And then we can place it in. Usually for bigger fillings, like you see here, the tooth is almost destroyed completely. We have just a lingual and buccal wall that is remaining. So in this case, most of the offices would offer you a crown because the, the tooth will break down. It's not, it's not going. So uh, an inlay or onlay can help with that. And we have, a, we have an inlay and onlay, you know, part of restoration. So, you know, when we talk about restoration, it's either composite or amalgam or inlay or onlay, just technically a lab fabricated filling that is, that is placed there. And usually it's for bigger fillings. When we have a bigger areas, that are uh, destroyed of the tooth and you want to give it another chance before going to a crown, you might do that. Yeah. And as you will see, uh, they can actually create this with uh, polyvinyl siliconate material. So it's a little, it'll be rubbery where you can fill it out and then just pry it out, you know, because it's like rubber. So it makes even more easier work. But yeah, it is a little bit more steps. But again, you don't have to worry about, you know, moisture control a little bit less, you know, because it, it will not be contaminated. Uh, you can make sure that all of that shrinkage happen outside of the patient mouth. You can compensate for all of that. You can make sure that the contour is correct. You know, it's touching all the teeth. So it gives you a lot of other benefits as well. And again, maybe the time that you, you know, work on this because it'll be much shorter because it's direct placement with your hand. You don't have to fight with the gum or the, the, the cheek or the tongue of the patient. And you can just do it outside and do all the work that you need to be done uh, and get it done. And again, nowadays also we have it, you know, you 3D, take a 3D image of that and then the machine will mill it for you and then you place it in the patient mouth. So um, the materials usually that is for indirect, these are can be just regular composite or can be fiber or, or, or particle reinforced. And as I was saying, you know, we can have a better 
uh, more uh, wear and strength resistant, you know, it's more stronger material than the regular composite that we have. Because again, it's, it's lab-based material more than anything else. And we can um, again, create stronger material that will stand better occlusive loads um, if we do the indirect method compared to the direct one. So it can be done in laboratory process or it can be just chair side process as you'll see. So in lab, we can just send it to the lab. They'll give us a little bit more better material or can we do it chair side just technically uh, by, you know, doing that process that we saw in the, in the pictures, making a dye and then filling that dye with the composite. But again, with the no, newer machines that you have like a milling machine in your office, you can almost do like a laboratory uh, quality of, of inlays. Okay. The last slide here is the compomers and gyomers. And these would release fluoride. fluoride, exactly. This is kind of the newer types of composites. The gyomers, technically the same, but they actually also absorb fluoride, not just release it. So that's a great thing. When you brush your teeth with a fluoride toothpaste, you can get that absorbed, just like glass ionomer, right? It can absorb fluoride and release it. So that's a great thing. And these are kind of the newer uh, technologies in composite. Any questions? You didn't think a one chapter will last that long. Yeah. <laughs> Let's stop the recording for now and I'll show you that video. I also, I did place